And I'm just really happy to introduce um, Leslie Shapiro. She's a master's prepared licensed marriage and family therapist in Washington state. In her clinical practice as a mental health therapist for THP Consulting and Northwest Relationships in Tacoma, Washington, Leslie works with people who struggle with hoarding disorder. And prior to completing her master's degree in couples and family therapy at Antioch University, Seattle, she worked as a residential organizer and coach. And she's going to be talking to us about a very important topic, hoarding disorder and geriatric patients. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Well, I am so excited to be here um, and share with you my knowledge of hoarding disorder. So let's get started. So um, before I get started on what is hoarding disorder, um, something that I thought was really exciting um, happened in 2013. Um, the new DSM came out, which was the DSM-5. Prior to that, it was the DSM-4. The DSM stands for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And in 2013, something exciting happened. Prior to that, hoarding disorder was under obsessive compulsive disorder. And the reason I mention that is even to this day, I still have people have confusion over OCD and hoarding as one diagnosis. Um, and in fact, they're separate diagnoses. Most people do know that, but I just like to mention that. So again, in 2013, the DSM-5 came out and um, it was established that hoarding disorder was its own diagnosis separate from OCD. I'll get into this later um, that OCD and somebody can have OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder and hoarding disorder, but they're separate. So when we're looking at hoarding disorder, there's a whole criteria list that we look at, but there's a few things that we look at that they need to have to meet the criteria. Um, and later in the talk, I'll go, I have a slide that shows the whole list, but these are the four main ones that we look at. So the first one is excessive acquisition of stuff. Um, and hopefully you can see that asterisk at the end. Um, and the reason there's an asterisk is, according to the DSM-5, I believe it's 90%, no, that's the other thing. According to the DSM-5 um, and my background, not everybody excessively acquires. And what that means is that everybody, not everybody that hoards excessively acquires. So what that looks like is they are bringing in things that are into their home continually. Um, some people that struggle with hoarding disorder do continually bring things into the home. And what that can look like is um, seeing something on the side of the road that they can't uh, pass up. So that could be like a free dresser, um, a chair. Another similar thing would be um, now that the libraries are open again, sometimes there's paper paraphernalia or at the grocery stores, there's recipe cards. Um, so anything that they can get that they can bring into the home, that could be um, going to the shopping store and there's a sale on something, so they want to bring more in that into the home, or um, going to the Value Village sales, I believe they're on Tuesdays, so they're continually bringing things into the home. And the reason I think it's important to mention is when you go into a home, you might see if you have been in, in fact into the house of somebody that hoards, you might see lots of piles of items. Sometimes it's a clean hoard where it's neat, neat items uh, and sometimes it's piles, but it'll look like they're constantly bringing things in and that's just not the case. And I'll get into why that's not later. But again, not ac everybody excessively acquires. I'm gonna use my arrows, not my mouse. Okay, the second one um, that's really common is and important to note is difficulty discarding. And this, this is one that everybody that has hoarding disorder uh, meets. And that's, again, difficulty discarding. So they have a very, very hard time letting go of items. Um, that's donating, throwing away, selling, what have you. They just have a really hard time letting go or discarding. Um, one important thing to note is it doesn't matter uh, what the value of the thing is. 
to them, it's a treasure. So something that looks like um, junk to you or trash to you uh, is a treasure to them. So it just depends. Uh, the third one that we look at that's really important is living spaces that can't be used for their intended purposes because of the clutter. So what that's referring to is you might go into a home where um, you can't even enter the home because the egress or ingress, meaning the entrances, are not attainable because you can't even open the door to the residence um, because there's so much stuff in the house that you, that you can't even push the door open. Um, or there's what we call goat paths, um, which means they you're kind of inching your way around the home where things are stacked up either to the waist or higher and they've created what we call goat paths. So you're kind of making your way around. They might be storing items in their stove or on top of the stove. The countertops are covered. Um, there's also pathways in the kitchen. They can't cook in their kitchen. They're not using their living room for intended purposes. They might have just a chair in there. They may in fact be sleeping in the chair in the family room. Uh, there's piles surrounding them. They might be using the bathroom. Uh, maybe not, it depends. Sometimes it gets so severe that they're using the shower pole for extra storage for clothes. Sometimes they're not able to be able to use the, the shower itself because of that, or there's no wanting water, that's when it's really severe. Sometimes there's not a running toilet. Again, that's when it's really severe. Sometimes they're not able to sleep on their bed anymore because they either can't access the um, bedroom anymore or they're crawling over stuff to the bed or sometimes it's so full they can't even access the bedroom. So again, it can go from mild to really severe. So sometimes they can't use any of the home or sometimes it's some of the home. So again, they can't use rooms for their intended purposes. So again, not cooking in the kitchen, maybe not being able to use uh, the bathroom or the bedroom, the living room. So again, it can go from mild to really severe. And the fourth one that we look at is it causes significant distress or impairment. So where it causes significant distress and impairment is in the occupational, social, and um, occupational and social impairment. So what that means is um, socially, it affects them because sometimes they're not able to have people over or they don't want to have people over. So they might not be able to have people over because they can't, they can't come into the home because they can't enter, like I mentioned, or they're, they're embarrassed to have people over, so they don't want them over. Or they might have had people over in the past and they've tried to help clean up and they're scared to have them over. Occupationally, it can affect them um, where they might be continually late for their job because they can't have, find a pair of shoes or they have one pair or they're always running late because they struggle with time management um, or things to that nature. It also affects them financially. Um, sometimes they're spending all of their money on items or extra storage facilities. Um, they can't find uh, their checkbook or the password to their um, checking account to pay their bills on time. They might have lost several paychecks under piles of items um, or things like that. So that's how it affects them financially. So again, socially, occupationally, and financially. So it really um, affects them in those three avenues. Um, it'll, it amazes me with the clients that I've worked with, they will find a way to find money to pay for a storage facility, even if they can't pay for other things because their stuff is so important to them. And you'll see that asterisk hopefully at the bottom, it says not universal in all people who hoard. And that's again, um, referring to excessive acquisition. So again, bringing in items excessively into the home. So again, not all people who hoard excessively acquire. So how many people um, hoard uh, in the US and outside of the US? The average uh, research projects, projects uh, two to 6% of the population. 
um, which is about 50 million. Um, and this slide says it's on the high end. I actually think it's on the low end. Um, and I usually like to ask the audience why they think that is because, but because it's Zoom, I'm gonna tell you why that is. Um, and that's because of the stigma associated with hoarding. Um, at THP Consulting, we offer a support group for folks that hoard. And one of the biggest things that they really struggle with is, uh, besides hoarding, obviously, is the shame that's associated with hoarding. And it's really hard for them to even sometimes hear the word hoarding, and they don't like to call themselves a person that hoards or uh, the, the word that I don't like is hoarder. Um, they, it, it's a real, it's stigmatized because there's the shows that show hoarding and they look like they're dirty and lazy and it's really um, projected in a negative light. Um, and with this percentage, believe it or not, one in 20 people hoard. So if I was in a room with you right now, which I wish I was, one in 20 people in that room, so say there's 100 of us, you either know somebody in your family that hoards, you have somebody that you work with, um, a partner of a loved one, or what have you, there's one in 20. So that's a lot, it's staggering. And with more knowledge becomes more um, wealth of information, which is great about hoarding. And I think with that, there's more, um, there's more data out there as we get farther and farther along, which is great. Um, there's research that older people hoard more than younger. And what that means is it doesn't mean that younger people don't hoard, but as people get older in age, hoarding is more prevalent and shows up more. Um, and why that is, is the median age with hoarding, used, they used to say that it started at ages between nine and 11, but now the research is really showing between ages um, 11 and 15, more in adolescents. And why I think it's showing up later is because as whatever the, the nature of the family is, usually kiddos don't either share a room or have a room, but their parents or whoever's raising them has more control over the room they're in. So they're getting rid of the stuff in the room um, and they're not in control of the house. Uh, as kids age and move into adolescence, their parents have to, you know, have, they have to let go of control a little bit because they're going into teenagehood and the kids might have, you know, more stuff stashed under the bed or things like that. And as they get older um, and make, they make it an apartment or a house, they're able to hoard more and more. Um, and as they get into uh, 40s and 50s is when we really see the hoarding increase and kind of stave off um, is when we get into empty nest syndrome or um, people going into senior senior years, I've seen it actually um, where it's at its worst, even though it hasn't gotten worse, is because they're isolated. They might have lost a lot of their partner or spouse. Um, they're moving into smaller um, places of living. So they've had to downsize, which is really hard. So they're, for all of those reasons, I think that's why we're seeing it as they get older. Um, there's a discrepancy of information with lower people hoarding um, rather than higher income hoarding. Um, and I think that information is out there because when people of higher income hoard, they're able to hire out folks to help them. So professional organizers, mental health, um, they can buy bigger homes um, and people with lower income aren't able to do so. Also, um, when you have less income, you're more, you want to hang on to stuff more because you don't know where your next paycheck is, or um, you don't, you don't know what you're going to, you, things are more uncertain. However, that just because you have more money doesn't mean you're not going to be uncertain or fearful of that. Um, when I was a professional organizer, it didn't matter what the socioeconomic status was, it, the hoarding was still um, the same. The gender differences, there actually um, isn't a gender difference. Um, the same amount of, there's the same amount of hoarding between men and women. Um, in the most recent research that I've been reading, there's more clutter with women typically than men. 
Um, but again, I think it comes down to stigma um, and I hate to generalize, um, but I think there's more stigmatization with men going, seeking mental health versus women. And I think that's also another factor. Because I am a marriage and family therapist and I was trained under fab the fabulous Jennifer Sampson, um, I look at the bio so, 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 excuse me, biopsychosocial model um, and I encourage all of you to do so with all of the people that I was told that were attending, which I'm so excited about. It's really important to look at all three. Um, the, the biological, there's a family history there's, like I mentioned in the previous slide, there's a steady course and progression throughout life. Um, and there's brain functioning differences, which I'll get into later. Um, there's a psychological aspect, which is um, there's co-occurring diagnoses. Um, and one thing I didn't mention in the earlier slide is this is the 92% that I was gonna talk about. According to the DSM-5, they say that 92% of people with hoarding disorder or 90% have co-occurring diagnoses. And now the percentage has actually gone down with the research. I will tell you, I've been working with folks at HORD um, in grad school, which was 2012 when I started. But prior to that, I worked with people that HORD as a, an organizer. I have never met anybody that I've worked with, hoard, with hoarding disorder that did not have a co-occurring diagnosis. So again, they say in the DSM-5, 90 or 92% have co-occurring diagnosis. Um, the other thing that we see psychologically is unresolved trauma and loss. The more research that comes out, which is so great about that there's more research, the more we see a lot of unresolved trauma and loss. Um, there's cognitive distortions we see a lot, um, which I'll go into in a little bit. And there's behavioral reinforcement. So again, if I was with you, I would say how many of us avoid things um, that we don't like? So how many of us avoid things that are uncomfortable? Everybody pretty much raises their hands. Me, it's taxes. Um, and how many of us do things that feel good? Everybody usually raises their hands, you know, eating chocolate, going shopping, what have you. Um, and then the social implications are there's major life events and transitions. So that could be um, the family is doing well um, socially, financially, what have you. And then something up, an upheaval happens like, um, the loss of a loved one within the family that they're close to, um, like a sibling or an auntie or a parent, or there's a job loss. Um, and so they all of a sudden have to move and there's this rupture um, or there's a divorce um, or some kind of mental health, um, unresolved mental health or substance use disorder becomes apparent. So there's some kind of um, major life event that causes um, social impairment um, and it's not resolved. And then a burden on families. Hoarding is a severe burden on families. It doesn't mean that you can't work with the families, but when what I'm talking about is if the family member or grandparent or um, hoards, it really affects the children that are in the home um, and especially as they grow up. So that's what that's referring to. And the reason it's important to talk about the biological, psychological, and social um, is it takes a village to work with somebody that hoards. So it's so important to look at the, the medical, the psychological, and the social because they all need to work together. Um, that's why I'm so happy there's nurses and doctors and psych psychologists, I was told who was gonna be in here, and social workers in here because it's so important to work together. It really needs to be a holistic um, treatment. So this is just kind of reiterating what I talked about um, on the previous slide, but again, biological is family history, um, and then there's information processing def deficits. Um, these are some of the uh, mental health di diagnoses that are co-occurring. Um, I have another slide that goes over the, the percentages of what we've seen in the past. Um, but some of the co-occurring diagnoses we see a lot are depression, anxiety, 
um, OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. And remember I said those two are separate. So someone can have hoarding disorder and OCD, but they're separate. Um, ADHD or ADD, which is attention deficit disorder or attention hyperactive, sorry, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. I'm sure all of you know that, but just in case I'm saying what it stands for. Um, personality disorders is another one. Um, so, and then severe and persistent mental illness. And one that's not on this slide is um, eating disorders. Um, and then again, social, I went into this, but the family dynamics. Um, and then one of the things that didn't mention is culture. So sometimes culture can be a, 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 a cause. So that can be within someone's culture of how they see their stuff within their family or in their society or in the culture of um, how they're brought up. Um, so that can be within their family. There's a, a cultural perspective religiously or within the family, they have a cultural perspective on stuff, if that makes sense. And if not, you can ask me later in questions and jot it down. So this is really important. So this can be confusing because I will say the word clutter, um, but just because you have a cluttered home, that does not mean it's hoarding. So I really like to distinguish the three. So what's the difference between clutter, collecting, and hoarding? So this is embarrassing to admit, but I now have teenage twins, but... I was a professional organizer. This is not a picture of my house, by the way, but there has been so many times that my houses look like this and I'm admitting that openly in front of a lot of people. So clutter is the possessions are disorganized and maybe accumulated, but here's the difference. Um, it's not causing um, difficulty with carrying on with normal activities, like I mentioned on the first slide. So um, they're gonna be able to cook in their kitchen, they're, they're still able to see that, see that person on the couch carrying on with work. Um, and they're not gonna have a difficulty discarding items. Um, and this says excessive acquisition. And again, that's not with everybody that hoards, but there isn't. And here's the other difference. If I myself want to have somebody over, it's gonna, I would be able to say, hey kids, it's time to purge some toys or hey Leslie, it's time to purge some whatever. I would be able to do that. And that would also not take me a long time to shove stuff in bins and clean stuff up before having somebody over. Whereas with somebody with hoarding disorder, that would not be the case. They would not, they would have a really difficult time discarding. It would not take them a, a you know, a snap, hop and a jump to get this ready. And they wouldn't be able to carry on with normal activities. So again, it can be, you can have clutter and it's not hoarding, but when it has the other factors going on, that's hoarding. So they, the just again, the distress of letting go of items and the inability to make decisions regarding items are red flags. So if you see a home like this, you shouldn't automatically say, oh, that's hoarding disorder. Um, this is an example of collecting. Um, so collecting is exists existing and new possessions that are a part of a larger whole. Um, and the display does not impede active living areas. So there's times that somebody will call themselves a collector, but if the collection is so vast that you're tripping over things that um, you're, um, it's impeding the space or there's like QVC boxes or eBay boxes that aren't even open that they've bought. So say they have a train collection, but they're not even opening the boxes. They have the intent to display them, but they're not. It doesn't look like this where they're not tripping over them, et cetera. That's not collecting. Collecting again is there's a set of likes with likes, like, you know, cookie jars or, um, Royal Daltons or Toby mugs or Thumble, um, sorry, I can't think of the word, the thing for sewing. Um, so just collections of items, but again, they don't impede space. And the other thing is the collector gets joy out of um, having them, but also is not very distressed when they have to let go of them. Um, there's a really good article uh, that I can send you at the end well, I like it. It's, it's 
arguing the difference between collecting and hoarding via the DSM-5 or the Diagnostic excuse me, Statistical Manual that I think is really good if you have more questions about this. Um, but again, I'm just gonna look at this question quick. Oh, um, so again, that's what the difference is. Okay, and this is hoarding. So the possessions become unorganized piles of clutter. So again, I'm using clutter, but they're unorganized piles. Um, they prevent the rooms from being used for normal activities. So again, remember I said it can be the whole house or apartment um, where they're not able to use their home for regular activities or that they that typically are used. Um, it says the motivation to display items is lost. So again, there's that intent to display like, oh, I have, so you might hear from the client, well, I have this bookshelf that I haven't put together, but if I just get that bookshelf out and I put the, you know, and if I just do that, then it'll be organized. So they have these intentions, but they don't follow through. So that's why I mentioned the eBay boxes and the um, QVC boxes, because I, I hear that a lot from some of my clients. Um, so that's the difference between clutter, um, collecting and hoarding. So are there other, I'm just gonna move this cause I can't, there we go. Are there mental, other mental health issues related to hoarding? Absolutely. So if I haven't mentioned this and I think I have, hoarding disorder is a mental health disorder, which I think I've, is obvious, but I just wanna really clear, like solidify that. So there are co-occurring diagnosis. And again, I will say, uh, I, in my personal experience with working with people that hoard, 100% of the time I've seen them, they have had co-occurring diagnosis. So what that means is they have had some other mental health condition going on. Um, so what that means is they might have depression or anxiety or substance use disorder. So that's what this slide is referring to. Um, the reason I changed the percentage to 75%, that's what the, the latest research is saying. I'm just telling you my personal experience versus the research, but I like to let people know the research because I think it's important and I love research. So this is what I have um, from my latest on the percentages of how much people um, via research have had major depressive disorder, social phobia, generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, organic brain illness, personality disorders, ADHD, dementia, eating disorders, and substance abuse. Um, I will get into some of these diagnoses later, um, but some of these, if they have dementia, and then displaced hoarding disorder, it's not considered hoarding disorder, but don't worry, I'll explain that later. Um, but what's important to know is they can have both. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to treat the major depressive disorder first um, because they might be so depressed, they're not able to get out of bed or shower or, you know, so sometimes it helps to treat that first. Um, and that's the other reason I like to share this slide. So hoarding disorder in older adults, which is why we're here. So this is really, really important. Um, so I mentioned that hoarding disorder starts between 11 and 15. Um, symptoms of severity, they've noted um, increase with each decade of life. So every 10 years, their symptoms of severity worsen. Um, there's, and what that means is, which I keep saying, I'm going to get to stuff and I swear I will, there's cognitive impairments, which I mentioned a little bit, their cognitive impairments worsen. So that includes executive functioning and things like that. So every decade that occurs, which can be incredibly frustrating. Um, so when I'm talking about executive functioning, it says increased dysfunction here. So that's 
mental control, working memory, inhibition, and set shifting. So um, mental control can be things like um, staying on task, organization, um, working memory. Um, inhibition can be impulse control or, or compulsion. So in, you know, impulse control is, can, is a lot of times related to, um, in terms of hoarding, shopping, or doing compulsive behaviors relating to shopping. So there's sometimes with hoarding, there's impulse control and compulsiveness. So, and then set shifting is um, being rigid, not, so a lot of times with people that hoard, it's really hard to not be, uh, it's hard to be flexible with thought. So that's why I talked about the intent to do something and they get really stuck and fixed mindset um, and they can't, um, change that flexibility. It's hard for them to do that. So that's why I think it's important to mention that. Um, so some of the research that came out of this was 25% of elderly community dwelling daycare residents and 15% of nursing home residents displayed hoarding the symptoms. So I know this is high percentages and they're doing more and more research on this, but um, all this is talking about is um, the differences of percentages that were displaying hoarding. Um, there's major consequences for people that hoard for both, but it's worse for older adults. So when I say that, I'm talking about increased risks of fall, fire hazards, food contamination, um, social isolation, and uh, medication mix management, mismanagement, excuse me. Um, there's also, um, I mentioned there's sometimes there's piles of things. So there's also, because we live in the Pacific Northwest, there's risks of avalanche. So what I mean is things can fall on top of people, which is really scary. Um, not only are there increased risks of falls, but tripping hazards. So um, sometimes we'll have what's called a clean hoard, which means they just still too, have too much stuff, but they stack things. So I've been into people's homes where, and I admit I'm, uh, not the most graceful person, but they'll have books lined up on the, uh, the, the bottom of the wall, the baseboards. Um, and the, I, I've tripped on the book. So, you know, I'm in, you know, I'm in my mid forties. And if I'm tripping on that and I have good sight and, and relatively good balance, if I'm tripping over stuff that I imagine somebody that's in their senior years. So that's really scary. Um, and all of this is really scary, but um, added all of that that I just listed, um, it makes it really, really scary. There's also um, an increased risk in medical conditions on top of that. So if you have somebody, like I said, that is younger and has hoarding disorder, but then you talk about somebody in their senior years, um, if they're not able to regulate their medication, if they're not able to use their house for intended purposes, that means they're not cooking in their kitchen. So they might be eating fast food or cooking out of a microwave. So they might be at risk of um, higher blood pressure. Um, if they are not able to clean their house the way they want to, there's a risk of dust. Um, there's a risk of mold because they can't vacuum and clean um, the way you normally can because there's, it's too hard to navigate. Um, there's also, if they're sleeping, you know, on pile, I've had clients where they're sleeping on piles of clothes. It doesn't matter the age. I've had folks in their upper 60s, 70s sleeping on the floor where they tell me they want to do that. It's not true. Um, or they are sleeping in a chair. Um, so that's when I like to talk about the biopsychosocial again. Um, they might develop, you know, sleep apnea because of eating out all the time. So then they, due to being overweight um, or having respiratory um, risks because of that. So it's like the list is kind of a vicious cycle. Um, and then because they're not getting good sleep and they might have depression, it's, you know, it exacerbates all those symptoms and it's a vicious cycle, like I just said. Um, and they might be self-medicating. Um, because they're scared to talk, say something about having hoarding. Um, so they're using substances. So dementia and hoarding. So this is a really high percentage 
but Tompkins is one of my favorite um, people that does research on hoarding. I have a couple. Um, and he estimated that hoarding behaviors occurred between 15 and 49% of de in dementia, dementia cases. Um, and that's because it can be hard to determine what's going on. Um, and again, this is from research, 1.9% um, of community dwelling in older adults and 22.6% in admitted to geropsychic wards. Um, so again, these were just, they did, went into these places and did um, a tally of what they determined was either people meeting criteria for hoarding disorder or not. Um, in nursing homes, people who hoarded had fewer diagnoses and impairments, they found. And I think the reason they deemed that was because they were, um, more monitored more and because they were in smaller dwellings. Um, but that again is not always the case in even in nursing homes. Um, and then it said in it says in community daycare hoarding was associated with dementia, psychosis, and an, a, agitation. Um, so I think it also can depend on where they're at, who's um, involved in their care. Um, and not seeing the people that are working there, but I need family members. And so what their um, protective factors are. So there's a lot of challenges with working with hoarding in general, but in particular with older adults. Um, there's reduced capacity to cook, reduced capacity, excuse me. And that I already talked about, but cooking, cleaning, bathing, sleeping. Um, so bathing, I mentioned this earlier, but um, a lot of times there's not access to the shower because they might be using their shower curtain rod for storage. Um, it's really severe if there's no running water, right? Um, and again, I talked about sleeping in the, you know, the reclining lazy boy in the, the living room versus in the bed. Um, using the stove and stovetop for storage, things like that. And then there's decreased physical and emotional support. So that's what I was talking about before. So most certainly not blaming the facilities, but sometimes what happens is they've lost their partner or their spouse, or they've never been married. And their kids are fed up with the hoarding and they don't understand it. So they've kind of been written off and there's um, a real, there's, there's no support. Um, and that's something that I've seen a lot, which is super sad. Um, or the family is really supportive and the person that hoards has, has been like, I don't want to talk to you. So it can happen both ways. Um, so organic brain in illness, dementia or schizophrenia, or traumatic brain injury will limit the effectiveness of standard therapy approaches. So what that's referring to is, <clears throat> excuse me, because they can't develop insight into their hoarding behaviors, um, they're not going to make headway with um, regular therapy like cognitive behavioral therapy, because they're not going to um, be able to change the cognitions or thought patterns in their brain, thereby changing their behaviors or their feelings about um, they're the things they think about with their stuff. Um, so the whole cognitive behavioral model is you have thoughts, your thoughts make you feel things, um, and then you act on those behaviors. So if I was um, thinking a yucky thought and then it made me feel bad, I would have like probably not the most successful behavior. So the whole notion with cognitive behavioral therapy is reframing those um, negative cognitions into something more positive reframing it. Um, and it doesn't even have to be positive, just not so um, negative where you feel um, that yucky emotion that makes you have not a great behavior. Um, and when you do that, when you reframe it in a better way, um, it changes the way you act on the behavior and it changes the way you feel about a behavior. But if you don't have the um, ability to have insight into that, it doesn't work. So instead, what we look to is a harm reduction model. 
which was, uh, I mentioned Hopkins earlier. Um, he was the one who really developed that um, harm reduction model for hoarding. So there's um, a couple of folks that have done some really wonderful research on brain imaging um, research, and that's what I'm going to get into now. Um, and the one that has done really the most is Catherine Ayers, A-Y-E-R-S, and again, if you have any questions at the end, I can tell you about them, and David Tallon, and that's what this a lot of this research is based on. So there's a couple of questions that come up a lot. So this is referring to a cluttered mind. So one that comes up for, for folks a lot and people that I work with is two things. Um, doesn't she see how filthy her house is? Doesn't she care or how cluttered it can be? Um, this is such a simple decision. Why is he or she getting so upset? The people just sometimes are like, I don't get it. Why can't they just make this decision and let it go? Or why are they getting so upset about a thing? I hear that a lot from family members and I hear that a lot from just people that I do consulting with. They, they just kind of want to pull their hair out. Sometimes they're so frustrated by it. So there's two main questions again that come up. Um, why don't why don't people who hoard seem to notice the clutter or get upset about it in daily life? So the failure to get upset. And why do seemingly simple decisions feel so difficult for them? Inability to make decisions. Um, so when research was first coming out about hoarding, um, we believed that it was due to habituation. So sometimes that is the case, by the way. Um, and what that's referring to is sometimes you become somebody that would be in a hoarded home would become habituated or used to it, like lived in it so long they didn't see the hoard anymore. So sometimes that does happen. So I, I have had folks that I've worked with where they've fallen ill and they've come back from the hospital and they're like, I came home and I saw my house and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it got this bad. I had no idea. Um, and then that's why they go into therapy. Now, does that like, is that like the magic wand that fixes everything? Absolutely not. But they have like insight into their hoarding behaviors for, it's like eye-opening. That's really rare that that happens. Um, but instead, what we've noticed is um, there's main brain functioning differences in individuals with hoarding disorder. Um, there is executive functioning differences decision-making, processing of reward value, failure to get upset, and insight. So I'm gonna talk about the brain and um, bear with me, but I think it's really, really, really important. Um, and this is the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the salience network. So. All the salience network is, is it, so salience, first of all, means, basically means important. So the salience network works like this. So it determines for us whether something, whether or not something is in worthy or unworthy of our notice. Okay. So um, say I'm going to my mailbox and this is something I actually do. I, I, cross the street to go to my mailbox, I grab all my mail and being an organizer, or a lot of people do this that don't have hoarding disorder, I open my, my recycling bin and I start sorting through my, my mail. And I'm like, junk, 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 keep, keep, keep. And I'm, but I'm actually going junk, keep, junk, keep, junk, keep. And then I head into my house and I'm done. Okay, so what's really cool about the salience network is, again, it's, letting me know what's worthy and unworthy of my attention. So my salient network is, is rapidly making decisions like that. It's like kind of like, it's like turning on and off, on and off. So on for keep, off for don't keep. So it's like on, off, on, off, on, off. And it's going really, really fast because my brain has the ability to make decisions and let me know what it thinks is worthy of my attention and unworthy rapidly. It happens super, super fast. Okay. 
So that's kind of really simplifying the salience network. And so how I remember it is salience important. Sorry, I keep clicking on the outside of the slides. Um, so the insular cortex helps us detect specific things in the world that we should pay attention to and helps coordinate with the angular cingulate cortex to help us figure out what we should respond to or how we should respond to things behaviorally. So that's kind of getting more into how it works. Um, there's a whole another talk we could do about the salience network. It's actually very fascinating, but I wanna really simplify it for hoarding disorder. And again, one thing that I didn't mention is this happens unconsciously to us. Like we don't even know what's happening for folks that don't have hoarding disorder. We just do that like rapidly. We don't even know we're doing it. It's pretty cool. So I'm gonna break down the parts of the salience network for you. So the angular cingulate cortex involves tasks, because I think it's important, tasks such as emotion formation and processing, empathy related responses, learning and memory, error detection, outcome monitoring and action planning and decision-making. The insular cortex involves tasks such as motor tasks, amygdala activation, social emotions, language, time and decision-making. Um, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, excuse me, plays an inhibitory role in expression of emotions, extinction of conditional emotional responses. So in other words, breaking, new ha breaking habits. Um, damage or deficits include behavioral control or moral decision-making. And then the orbital frontal, orbital frontal cortex plays a role in order cognition like decision-making, impulse control, response inhibition, and process of reward value. This one's really important to remember, especially with hoarding disorder. So again, the salience network, if you want to remember it this way, is an automatically, automatically happens for people that have a, a non-hoarding brain are able to de deem what's worthy and unworthy in, uh, of their attention and happens super fast. Um, so Talon did this really cool research where he hooked up people that had hoarding disorder and that didn't have hoarding disorder to an fMRI. Um, and in the samples, people that were not, people that hoarded, that were making non-hoarding related decisions had an under-functioning or a hypo um, response during the science network. So when they weren't making decisions, it was under-functioning. Um, they had lower activity. Um, and then this was compared to people with obsessive compulsive disorder um, and controls when making non hoarding decisions. So, not decisions, excuse me. So, again, people that hoard had under functioning, and then people that um, didn't struggle with that had lower activity, but theirs was um, at a resting state, so kind of flat. So, when they still had them hooked up to the fMRI, and they had the people that hoard make decisions about their items, their items that they owned, it went from resting state to overdrive. So it was really over-functioning. So their salient work, network. So instead of like when I make decisions, so say they were deciding on their, their mail, it was on, 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 on. So it wasn't on, off, on, off. It just stays on. So again, if somebody with hoarding disorder is going through their mail, their brain doesn't know to turn it off. It just, it's like saying, keep, 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 or it's, it just stays on, it goes into overdrive. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then when they made decisions about things they really cared about, they would bring other things in, it went into way, way overdrive. So they're really, um, the salience was even higher. So if it were on a scale from zero to 100, it was like 150. Um, so when we go back to thinking about the salience network, so we think about the, the frontal cortex. So this is all where we make um, really 
thoughtful decisions. So it's like um, multi-step direction, organization, purposeful planning, um, or uh, organization, spatial. So all the things that um, we do that we do with more thought. People with hoarding disorder, instead of using the salience network, they use their frontal cortex. So it takes them this effortful, um, long time to make decisions because they're using the wrong part of the brain to make these very simple decisions. So they're thinking about it and they're thinking about it and they're processing it and they're overthinking stuff. Where when I go to make decisions about the, the mail or you do, you're just like, oh, okay, junk mail, junk mail, keep, keep, keep. Um, and they're using the, I hate to say this, but they're using the wrong part of the brain because they're not, um, and so they're overthinking it. Speaks nothing to how brilliant um, these folks that I work with with hoarding disorder are. Because let me tell you, they're some of the most creative, brilliant people I've ever worked with. They're just operating in the raw, the, the frontal cortex, which is why it's so, sometimes you'll see them struggling so hard to make decisions. Um, and like I said, it's over-functioning. And so inability to make decisions and indecisiveness, does it run in families? Absolutely. They actually found a specific um, genetic link. Um, and there's been my favorite, just kidding, twin studies what, that they've done um, where they were separated at birth and they still displayed hoarding tendencies. Now, does that mean, so I've had people in my hoarding support group for friends and family, like petrify that they're going to have hoarding symptoms. That doesn't mean that someone's going to have, you know, start hoarding. Um, that just means that genetic chromosomes, they're same as with depression or OCD. Um, it can also be a learned behavior. So I've worked with families where it's multi-generational from the grandparent all the way down to the grandchild, and they all lived in the same house, um, which is it, you know, innate behaviors? Is it learned? Is it both? I think both. Um, so again, that doesn't mean somebody that's going to, has a family member will hoard. I've actually seen the opposite because they're so aware. Um, there's also been a link to ADHD and inattention. So not only do folks that hoard struggle with um, making decisions, being distressed, letting things go, using um, their frontal cortex to make really simple decisions and over-functioning in their salience network, but they have um, challenges with inattentive, inattentiveness with ADHD. And they have co-occurring diagnosis. So they're struggling with all of those things. And by the way, that doesn't mean they meet all the criteria for ADHD or ADD, but they're on, they meet some of the criteria in particular, um, staying on task is really, really hard, which I argue, how would anyone be able to stay on task when they have all that going on? It's exhausting. So this is just going over executive function and planning. Um, it's, so people in hoarding populations, um, they have information process, processing difficulties. So they have an over-reliance on visual. So that's a lot of times why you see piles because they do not trust their own memory. This has really been extensively researched. They really believe that if it's, out of sight, it's out of mind. And sometimes that's the case because they're visual sometimes, but it's also, they don't trust their own memory. Um, there's also been cases where folks that hoard will either under categorize or over categorize. So over categorizing is like, say, so I have like a, a, a file that says 2020 taxes. And then like my, my labels are in there for like the different things I have to do for taxes. Um, over categorizing is making too many labels where you make so many labels for the files, you don't even know where you put stuff, if that makes sense. And then under categorizing is if I made a, a file that said 2020 taxes and I just shoved everything in there. That's even not that, that um, under categorizing, but it's pretty close. Or like say I said stuff and then just shove stuff and stuff. So 
they're both not great because it's hard to find things. Um, churning is when um, somebody you might, so I will be working with somebody that I, uh, a client and they'll, what's one blessing of um, COVID is that I've been able to work with clients on a video. And so they've been brave enough to show me their house. And so they can show me what progress they've made, which has been fantastic because I do therapy uh, via telehealth. Um, and they'll show me and they'll be like, either they'll say, look at all the progress I made or they haven't made any. Well, to me, if a client's able to start letting things go to me, that's even if it's like one thing, it's huge. But to some, it might look like not a lot because what happens is um, they do what's called churning. So they will um, have something on a, their desk and it's a piece of paper and it's a bill. And they're like, well, I um, need to pay this, but I don't have anywhere to put it. So I'm going to set it here. And then they find a newspaper and they're like, well, I want to read this newspaper and I'm going to get to it later. And they set that here. And then they're like, well, um, this is a magazine that I'm going to send to my friend and I need to get to that friend and they set it on there. And so it's like, it just kind of moves to one place to another, but nothing goes out of the house. So it's like, they're moving things from one place to another and they're really not making any progress, if that makes sense. They are, but they're, they're really not, which, um, and this is referring to um, the brain's executive functions, which I've gone over. A lot of times what's not talked about in executive functioning is emotional regulation, which is one that a lot of folks with hoarding really do struggle with. Just keeping an eye on time. Okay. So there's exaggerated ideas and feelings about possessions. Um, there's beliefs that they have a sense of responsibility. There's a strong sense of responsibility. So if I throw this away, it's a valuable opportunity, or it's my responsibility to be good to Mother Earth, or um, I have to save this for someone they might need it, or somebody, I once had this person need a hammer, and I had the hammer because I had five of them, and I had that one exact hammer for my neighbor. So therefore, because I have all those hammers, it's important. Or if it's out of sight, I'll forget it. It's a sense of control for people. Nothing ever should be wasted. So waste is a big um, component. If I save this, then I'm, I already said that, not wasting this. And then attachment is another one. So uh, it's a source of identity. Sometimes folks that hoard anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize things, meaning they, it becomes like a, a sense of uh, a friend to them, the, the doll or what have you becomes a, a part of them and also becomes like a friend. So it's like letting it go a, a part of their own identity and it'd be like throwing a friend away. Um, and then memories, it's like throwing a memory away in an important time in their life. So how are these attachments exaggerated? So everybody thinks this way sometimes towards some possessions, but people with hoarding disorder think about these things most of the time and over a lot of things and more strongly. Um, and then they extend this thinking to a broader range or range of possessions. Um, and they have a harder time being flexible with these beliefs. So they're really inflexible. It's like shoulds, must, always. Um, they, they have a very hard time being flexible with the, these um, rules. They're almost like rules. Um, and they feel like they have to obey their thoughts and feelings. So again, we go back to the two questions. Why don't people who hoard seem to notice a clutter or get upset about in daily life, failure to get upset. So again, they have an underactive salience network. Their brain isn't signaling that it that this is important um, and it needs unlikely to be explained by simple habit, habituation. So um, I wanna also point out that their brain is either saying, the salience network is either saying it's all important um, and the, it's not explained by, again, just simple habituation where they've lived with it for so long. And why do seemingly simple decisions feel so difficult? Their brain is signaling that um, everything is important. Their frontal lobes complicate reward processing, or again, they're using their frontal lobes for the, the wrong decisions. They should be instead using their salience network 
Um, and instead, you're, they're using the complicated part of their brain that's for more in-depth decisions, not just making decisions about stuff. Um, that should be for the salience network, if that makes sense. Um, they have cognitive deficits, especially attention. So they really struggle to stay on task. Um, indecisiveness, um, some believe, sometimes it's inherited. They have feelings of emotional attachment. They have maladaptive beliefs about their um, items that they're keeping. And it's easier to avoid than make a tough decision. So again, you know, it feels good to put things off what the, that are hard and it feels better to, you know, do things that feel good. So it's like a reinforced behavior over time. So this is um, what you see on the DSM-5. So again, Barbara mentioned that the assessments are at the end and I think it's so important to assess. So this is part of the attachments that I sent you, but the reason I show this is it says persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of their actual value because what you might think is not worthy they of attention or keeping they think is valuable. So someone will be like, oh, why are you keeping this junk? Um, and to them, it's not junk. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out that I said I would point out later is it says not due to another medical condition like cerebras cerebrovascular disease or brain injury. So what that means is if somebody, God forbid it's in like, um, some kind of accident and they hit their head and then start hoarding, that's not hoarding disorder. Or they have a stroke and they start hoarding, that's not hoarding disorder. However, if they were already hoarding and then had those um, things occur and they continue to hoard or it worsens, it is hoarding disorder. Um, not due to another mental health condition. Um, so if somebody is so depressed that they're not getting rid of stuff, um, but their depression gets better or they just need, um, you know, physical help. So there's physical limitations. That's not hoarding disorder. So it's really important to suss out those um, reasons. Um, there's specifiers, which is excessive acquisition. So remember I said that's not with, for everybody that hoards, not everybody excessively acquires. And then there's insight. So there's people, some folks that hoard have good insight. Some people have poor, which means they don't always recognize they have hoarding. And then there's some that unfortunately struggle with delusions. So that's people with schizoaffective or schizophrenia. So why, what's the best thing to do is always ask. It can be really uncomfortable to ask, but how do you know if you don't ask? So I've worked with so many people that have come to me and they weren't asked by other um, therapists or other people, because it can be really hard to ask the questions, um, you know, about their home, because it's personal, because this is the one disorder that we know, besides kind of OCD, that it's physically out there for everybody to see, um, really physically out there. Um, so these are some of the examples of things that you can ask. Um, this is a really great assessment tool. Um, especially now that I, I think some of us are still doing um, telehealth um, and we're not able to go into people's homes and some of you just don't anyways. Um, this can, it says be done in the physical observation of home, but you can most certainly do this via Zoom and you can most certainly do this on the phone and you don't have to be a mental health professional to use this. And that's the other why, reason I like it. So you can better understand the cause of the problem. Um, things that might be affecting the intervention. So like um, in impediments to change, uh, what social supports they don't have. Um, and it can be conducted as a conversation so it's less stigmatizing. Oops, sorry. Um, and this is just addressing what, like how long hoarding has been going on. And sometimes they don't know when it starts. It's hard to remember how long it's been going on what they feel about their possessions in their home, what they're currently acquiring, why they're saving it, what they do to organize, um, problems that have resulted from hoarding. So that's a really good one to point out because sometimes they don't see the problems with hoarding. Um, and then their personal goals is another really good one to get. The clutter image rating scale is another one that I do really like. Um, 
it's not a super realistic chart. Um, and I'll tell you why it was obviously posed. Um, and some of my clients laugh at this when I show it to them because they can tell it was posed, but it's still good. And it, there's two reasons I like it. One, it's talking about the, the house and not the person. So it separates the diagnosis from the person. And two, um, it's visual. Oh, and three, it's level. So I guess I have three reasons. No, I have four. I lied. Four, there's a bedroom. There's a living room. There's a kitchen. I think there's a bathroom and there's a family room. So it does like whole houses. And you can also use it as a conversation piece for family members that call. You can say, I'm going to show you this. And when, the la when was the last time you were in there? So say you're a nurse and the person that hoards has to go. I get calls about this all the time, by the way. My mom just had surgery. She struggles with hoarding. She needs to go back in her home and she needs to have a walker be able to go through the house. I don't know what to do. So the, the nurse or the social worker can say, can you tell me when the last time we were, were in your mom's house and what does it look like? So that's why this is a good assessment. So again, it's talking about the home, not the person and their safety. The homes is another good one. And home stands for health, obstacles, mental health, endangerment, and structure and safety. And this is another one that you can use without being um, a mental health practitioner. Excuse me. And I like this because it's really good for geriatric. And the other ones too are two also, by the way. But this one talks about, you can ask questions if somebody um, has hoarding disorder, but the onset of dementia, or you're trying to decipher between the two. So sometimes people will have like bright moments um, with the onset of dementia and they'll, they'll answer questions. So it's the way you ask the questions. For example, you know, you might, somebody might say to the person that um, if they're still living alone and you're not sure, or they don't have supports and you say, you know, did you take a shower? Well, they can say, and I'm sure all of you know this, I'm just pointing it out. Um, yes, I took a shower. So instead you say, are you able to use the shower? Or when was the last time you took a shower? If that makes sense. Um, again, sometimes we're not able to go in the home, but you can ask other people that are you can use this with caseworkers. You can use this with whoever's going into the home. You can do this via Zoom. Um, so it goes into all those really great de details like, is the garbage being taken out? Is it overflowing? Um, is there a presence of, um, you know, that you can see like spoiled food? Is there an overflow of items over the, um, um, the stove, are they able to cook in their kitchen? Um, you know, are they able to use their bathtub or shower? Um, and then the obstacles is, you know, it goes over those things that I was talking about, like, can they move freely in their home with a walker, with a cane, um, things like that? Is there unstable piles that could fall on them? Um, egresses and exits, is there a mean of exit and entrance? And by the way, I take a this sounds really awful and morbid, but I do it for everybody. And it's important if God forbid an EMT was going to come in, could they meet the, the, um, the three feet um, pass so that an EMT could get them in and out on a stretcher, which sounds really icky, but you want to make sure that they can open that door all the way that's so they can get out because it's safety. Um, mental health. So this is not diagnosing. This is checking into risk factors. So do they, seem, do they seem to be aware of the seriousness of the problem? Do they seem defensive or belligerent or angry? Um, do they seem uh, confused, on alert? Um, are they able to accept the, you know, the consequences of their behavior? Or do they seem anxious or apprehensive? So it's just kind of checking out what's going on and identifying risk factors. Um, and then endangerment is just checking, um, you know, at risk people. So the, the senior, um, the, um, if there's, you know, somebody that's disabled, that's living on the property, things like that. Um, but most importantly, we're talking about people that are in their senior 
um, years. And then structure and safety is the floor unstable. You know, are the stairs covered with items? Um, are there electrical wires exposed? Are they using too many electrical wires that are plugged into too many things? Um, you know, again, the running water, running electricity. Um, is there stuff blocking the, you know, there's a lot of homes with the old baseboard heat or those being blocked. Um, and how high is stuff stacked too? Like sometimes people think it's okay to if it's in boxes, but how high are the boxes? Um, I'm going to tell a story about my mom, which I'm sure she'll be thrilled, but my sister, this is kind of silly, but my oldest sister, so I'm the baby, um, thought my mom had hoarding and I was like, I would know, but okay. Um, and I'm telling you this because my mom was putting clothes in her, um, shower and hanging them on the clothes, the shower rack. And the reason she was doing that is because she doesn't like to ask for help, even though we would be there in a heartbeat. Um, her macular degeneration had gotten worse and she was hanging clothes on the shower rod so that she could see her outfits. So the reason I'm telling you this is I think it's because you might have that stuck in your head. Um, it's important to assess all the areas because um, they might do that for whatever reason. Um, and it's so important to check for tripping hazards and stuff as people age um, because it's so easy to trip regardless of age. Um, so we just want to really make sure we can minimize any kind of tripping hazards. It's, it can happen so easily. Um, this is the uniform inspection list. Um, this is a really good one just to have a list to check off if somebody's being really resistant. So you can say these, this is exactly what you need to make your home safe. The other assessments are the hoarding rating scale, which is a self um, assessment, which is good and bad. It's good that they can, you know, rate themselves, but sometimes if they don't have good insight, it's not the best. And then the saving self report measure, excuse me, and that's the saving inventory, the hoarding rating scale, they, um, we rate. Um, my other favorite is the activities of daily living with hoarding. Um, there was a case where caseworkers went into visiting older adults in their homes, and this was a study done a couple of years ago. And they, there was 80% was impairment in movement, 70% unable to use their sofas, 50% could not prepare food, 45% could not use their refrigerators, 42% could not use their sinks, 20% could not use their bathroom sinks, and 10% could not use their toilets. So to assess for salience networks, just look for um, hyper or hypo arousal. So hyper is um, salient network and overdrive and hypo is under, it's not, it's low. Um, and the clinical treatment for that is mindfulness. So guidelines for utilizing telehealth assessment and screening is utilize the clutter image rating scale. Um, and refer to the ICD clutter scale, which is on the next slide to determine level of hoarding. Um, and ask the patient if they're willing to show you the room they're in or take you on a tour of their home. And I said within reason, because they might be like, what? And get really scared. It takes, you have to build that trust. Um, and be observant and look at what you see. Oh, I pressed up, sorry. This is the clutter image scale. This is another one that you can talk about the levels of clutter. It goes over structure and zoning animals and pests, household functions, health and safety, and personal protective equipment. It's really great as a holistic treatment. Um, and this is really hard to read, but you can download it. So this is a, um, this is a level one or green. So it's a typical house. There's no blocked exits. There's no pests. You don't need protective equipment unless you want to wear, well, you know, if you masks because of COVID. Um, this is the level two. So the hoarding is starting to kind of cover up counters, but there's not really a concern for um, hoarding yet. You might need somebody that um, 
has an expertise in uh, professional organizing, but mental health is not needed yet. And then this is where you start to need mental health, um, social workers, case workers, maybe. Um, this is where it starts to get serious, which I know some of you are like, wait a minute, this is really looking bad, but this is actually not the most severe. They're still running water. There's still a means of entrance and exit. There's still pathways. This is when it starts to get more severe. So this is what you're gonna look for, by the way, in Zoom, like what's the window covered with? What are you seeing in the background? Um, are things like stacked up behind them? And this is where you really wanna think about like adult protective services, maybe social workers, primary care physician, things like that. There's no walking path. They'd have to crawl over things. Um, things could fall on them. There's tripping hazards. Um, there might not, there's probably biohazards, which is like um, spoiled food. Um, there might be um, different kinds of um, infestations. And this is the worst, this is severe. This requires a whole holistic treatment, um, with, which would include family if possible, mental health, social workers, et cetera. And this is, this is where there's no running water, no means of exit or entrance. Um, it's stacked up to the ceiling, it's, this is severe. So treatment planning is safety first, um, integrate co-occurring diagnosis. C CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is found to be the best treatment combined with motivational interviewing, organization training, decision-making training, exposure to non-acquiring, um, cognitive reconstruction and coping strategies. There's been a lot of trials. There's been some trials on um, medication, but none that's been like, aha, that's the medication. Paroxetine or Paxil is not very helpful. Uh, then Lefaxine or Effexor appeared somewhat helpful. Um, and then they started looking into SS, um, other SSRIs with a, a second medication after the first one didn't work. Um, and then they started looking into um, Alzheimer's medications um, as maybe potential. Um, and then the other one they looked into, which some of my clients have shown some benefit is ADD medication to help them keep on task. So there's a lot of safety risk, but we've kind of already gone over that earlier in slides. So um, lots of safety risks, but the one thing that I didn't mention was um, limits to hygiene um, and then limits to uh, medical needs because sometimes they're scared they're gonna get caught because if they do have insight, they're scared about what's gonna happen with their home. Um, um, and I mentioned all the other ones. This is talking about um, building a really great, strong, trusting relationship with your client, um, deeming if they are have mental capacity. Um, and that means, you know, are they able to make decisions on their own versus are they not? Um, and that can be done via assessment. Um, providing mental health training for co-occurring diagnosing, even if the treatment doesn't improve hoarding. Um, reducing risk by emphasizing increasing safety ra rather than eliminating hoarding behavior via a harm reduction approach. And then working appropriately with community agencies like I talked to about before. So that's really a coordinated response. Um, high risk, high capacity is really accepting the person's um, self-determination because they our high risk means meaning the safety is at risk, but they're at high capacity means they have the rights, they have the ability to make those decisions on their own. High risk, low capacity is where you're looking at again, risk to safety, but they have, they might need, you might need to look into guardianship or conservatorship because they are not meeting that high capacity. And then high risk, moderate capacity um, is actually the ideal. Um, that's where you can um, reduce risk increase your capacity through insight um, and reduce resistance through mental health and protective factors like um, social supports. Um, this, the one thing that we don't recommend is what you've seen on the shows, which is a clean out, which is where you come into the home and just basically go to bare bottoms where you clean out their whole home. And that's because of the traumatic, traumatic impact. Um, there are studies done where when somebody has been hoarding over um, 
10 years, they fill up their home. And when somebody has come in and done a forced clean out, um, within six months, that person will fill up their home even more full because it's so traumatic. Now, that doesn't mean that sometimes it's not necessary because of safety. Examples might be bed bugs. Um, you know, it's so it's so severe, like that level five that I showed you that they have to because they have to clean it out or risk of avalanche. So sometimes it's necessary, but it's not the ideal. Um, so the rule of thumb for treatment um, when there's no time to do therapy, like in those cases is safety first, skill second. So skills are talking about emotional regulation. So self-soothing, uh, self-awareness or mindfulness organization and categorization um, and therapy and everything else can follow. And that's including grief, loss and trauma um, and the hoarding work. So like decreasing acquisition or discarding. So the harm reduction approach um, refers to um, minimizing um, the harm, harmful consequences of hoarding, but not minimizing hoarding. So what that looks like is the person does not have to have insight into their hoarding, but um, recognizing the harm that's associated with hoarding. So that can be like spoiled food, the avalanches that I'm talking about, um, all the risks, so safety implications. So, um, you know, putting stuff in the oven, not being able to open the door all the way, um, not being able to sleep on their bed, not being able to clean. So things like that, that are going to cause harm to their well-being. Um, it also involves the well-being of their neighbor. Um, it doesn't prevent them from new uh, items coming in or they're discarding. However, this is really important. That doesn't mean that they can't get there. This is a first stepping stone for some. Um, within, uh, unless they have dementia or they have, um, they don't have the ability to gain insight into their behaviors. Um, and it's really helpful for individuals with cognitive impairments um, and for people that aren't willing or unwilling to seek uh, treatment. So, because at least you're keeping them safe. So what that looks like, um, this was really hard to get my head wrapped around with, as a therapist, because I wanted to do comfort first, um, but it's safety first. So moving flammables away from heat sources, clearing away uh, tripping hazards, clearing enough room around doors and windows so they can get in and out, and then health. So, which is hard for nurses and I'm sure other people in here, uh, clearing access to the bathroom and washing facilities, ensuring paper, proper food storage, um, addressing appropriate trash and waste disposal, eliminating pest infestations. And then last is comfort. So like heating, cooling, bedding, um, making a, a space to conduct daily tasks. Um, so it's not necessary to stop acquiring um, nor clear all the debris, debris to reduce harm. Um, it's a unique uh, for every person. The person that hoards should always be included regardless of where they're at. Um, you know, that, that is within reason. Um, but you, I, I generally want them involved because um, unless they have such severe um, dementia that's gonna cause them more distress or more harm than good, then I would say no. Um, I've already gone over the goals. So again, tips are assessment, screen for all for hoarding behaviors, identify all significant factors, including co-occurring diagnoses, um, and then prioritize treatment with all factors considered safety first, skill building second, and deeper processing third. Um, and then especially work collaboratively with as resources allow. Um, but once physical space is safe, decluttering does not need to be prioritized as the main focus. Um, sometimes it, you can work with, a, with, if the resources allow financially to work with an organizer that specializes in hoarding. Um, and that is it. I see some questions and I am happy to, to go over because I'm at 5.30. Oh, great. Ready.
Thanks so much, Leslie. This was incredible, just um, really helpful information. We do have some questions that I've been holding on to. No um, problem. Can you tell us a little bit about suicide risk among hoarders? Um, Cynthia mentioned she's had experience with such a case because of inability to deal with the overwhelming amount of clutter and perhaps shame? That's such a great question. Sadly, yes. Um, not often, but yes. And that's why um, I think it's so important to think about um, the traumatic effect on forced cleanouts. So um, I wish I knew more about the, the person and the case. I know you can't share. So yes, that has happened, but it's usually um, due to not the hoarding disorder itself, but the co-occurring diagnosis is my experience. Um, and also not having supports in place. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question. If you wanna ask further, um, let me know. But yes, I have. And, um, and we focused on decreasing suicidal ideation and thank goodness they didn't attempt. But yes, I have. But it's, it's, it was um, twice, but it was the two times I experienced it, it was about something else and not the hoarding, if that makes sense. So also Does that answer the question. Um, well, if not, don't, that's okay. Yeah, um, she might pop in again, but um, she actually had another question, and that was, yeah, um, if um, people are not necessarily experiencing distress about their possessions, what sort of distress do they experience? Since distress is one of the DSM five symptoms that you identified. So that might mean that they don't have, um, so the distress is usually when um, they are, um, so like, let me give you an example. So some of my clients, the distress is making decisions and they just get really overwhelmed. Some of it is, um, letting go of items. So it just depends. There's not like one person that's in a box. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I have, I've had clients reporting where they fill up a house and then they leave the house and then they do it again and they're over it and they still had hoarding. So it just, I know that sounds completely counterintuitive what I said, but they were attached to the items, but once they left and then they filled it up and got attached and then they did it again and again and again. So mm -hmm. I think it just depends, but the distress again could be towards letting go of the items. It could be towards making decisions about the items. It could be both. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's helpful. Um, also, Sharon is wondering, um, is having many pets inside or outside hoarding? Yes, that's a whole nother topic. Such a good question. So there's three type of different types of people that hoard animals. So I need to check on the latest research. Um, one is the, um, the type you see that they hoard and they think they're really helping the animals and they have way too many and they have, and they move counties when they get caught and they keep doing it again. So you see lots of recidivism. So, but they genuinely think they're helping and they have very severe, um, mental health disorders. So it's really hard to treat. It's typically, um, they have no insight. They don't know they're doing it. The second is they do it for monetary gain. It's usually somebody that has antisocial personality disorder, like, so like pu puppy mills. So they're, um, having them have puppies just for monetary gains. They don't care about the animals at all. Um, and the third is somebody might be, um, somebody that struggles with hoarding. They all have hoarding by the way, and they hoard animals. Um, and they get into a situation where they had a house and then the, the dog or cat had uh, um, babies. I'm just going to say, because I can't think of the names of kittens and puppies or both. And then they end up having to move to a smaller home and they're overwhelmed and don't know what to do. So there's those three types and it can be. So this is another thing about research. They say it's one type of animal. I've seen all different. So farm animals, birds, all of the above. So absolutely. And by the way, with the caretaking one, it's the houses in squalor, like um, completely not taken care of at all. And there's species and urine everywhere. And it's mm. really sad. Mm. So, yeah. 
So if someone wants help with their hoarding behavior, but has limited financial resources, no real social supports, and to clarify, um, um, this was, um, Annalie said this was, um, maybe they have a therapist, but they're just physically not able to go through things. Um, who should they contact? Do you have a sense? I get that question all the time. And I think it's such a good one. So what I, before the times of COVID and thank goodness, things are not kind of getting back to normal. Um, I do. So what I recommend is a couple of things, depending on their comfort, um, reaching out to, um, uh, university students that are going through, um, mental health, um, treatment so that they know how to help keep them regulated, but, you know, are also trustworthy. They can reach out to religious affiliations. They could reach out to AmeriCorps, um, but they want to make sure that the person that they work with has somewhat some understanding of hoarding or or do what I call body doubling. And that's where the person just sits with them and keeps them on tasks and is um, non-judgmental and just kind of keep them, you know, where I talked about, they get distracted and can't, um, so it just kind of helps keep them focused. And I've had that be really successful. So again, somebody from a religious affiliation or a college student that, or something like that. So that's been successful um, because yeah, not everybody can afford that. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Um, what is your sense about maybe the average time for improvement? Uh, you know, if they're getting some sort of treatment and improvement in um, the situation. So, um, you know, it's because it's kind of a lifelong um, disorder, it can take a long time, but I've seen people make gains in treatment, even from just going to the um, support group for a year, um, just because they've gained insight, but it can take, um, I hate to be a downer, but it can take years. Um, but the good news is, is that they can get better and they can learn skills and they can change, like they can get better. So, yeah. Um, uh, Mary Zeitner just mentioned that she had a patient who was forced, question mark, to donate her home to the fire department as a fire training site. Have you ever heard of anything like that? That's bizarre. That sounds horrible. Uh, yeah. So um, Marcy is asked about regarding the onset at 11 to 15 years old, does something trigger it if already prone to hoarding or is the risk reduced if there is no trigger event? Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you asked that. I, yes. So what I have seen is um, there can be like a, there can be a triggering event like um, the parents are getting divorced and I'm not, I'm a child of divorce. So I'm not ripping on divorce by the way. Um, but they, they don't work together as a team or, um, there's an unresolved trauma, like a death of a loved one or something like that, or somebody has mental health and they're not getting treated properly or substance use, but there's something, yes, there's definitely a triggering event or somebody in their family has hoarding disorder. So definitely. And the other thing I'm so glad you asked, this is such a good question, is that I have had people that are at the support group and they've had a triggering event where they kind of hoarded a little bit. So I have seen it get like more exacerbated or I don't want to say worse, but I guess it is where they lost a spouse, a pet and something else and their house got filled. So there's definitely triggering events and it doesn't always have to be, um, at a young age, but I think it shows itself because they're starting, because we remember being adolescents, we start to get a little more freedom. And that's why I think it starts to, does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. And I hope you don't mind. I meant to actually check with you before I slapped it into the chat box, but um, they were asking for your email address. So I no, I don't mind at all. Email. I, I love questions and okay. um, so I, yeah. I put your email in the in the chat box. Um, Nick is wondering how would you define recovery, and and how often does it happen? Well, so anyone I talk about, I always feel like I have to say this as a question. Anything I talk about, I can. By the way, um, there was an eighty-five-year-old woman that um, 
made uh, gains in treatment, meaning um, she didn't continue to acquire. Her home was um, not like better homes and gardens, because that's not going to happen, but um, was uh, organized and she um, did not um, backslide. So, and she was 85, which to me is amazing. So what that looks like is, um, you know, I see a lot of similarities to hoarding with substance use disorder. So there might be like relapses or backsliding, but what recovery looks like is um, they replace hoarding with some other pleasurable activity that's not another compulsive behavior. Because um, I've had other clients say, well, can I do go to gambling or play poker and stuff? And I'm like, no. Um, so, you know, they're doing like some other pressurable event, like volunteering or seeing their friends socially or something like that. Um, and they're not bringing more items in that they can handle. Um, and they're starting to think about their stuff a different way. Um, that's how I would see it. And, and they're able to let, oh, well, of course, and they're not, um, they're able to discard stuff without distress. That would be the other one. So not acquiring if that's a problem able to let go of things without distress, um, replacing the hoarding behaviors with something more positive and changing the cognitions of how they think about their stuff. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your staying a little bit over um, and answering questions as well. This was just very, very informative. Um, appreciate it. I'll see all of you um, next week. And Leslie, thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you.